We are going to talk about the construction of a ship that, as far as possible, resembles vessels of 200 years ago, and then how to sail that ship in a, let's call it, semi-historic manner over some 2,000 nautical miles of partly open sea. For reasons that will easily become obvious, we won't have to talk much about reinventing skills, but more about how our modern world deals with such technology and approaches. The ship was built and sailed before the background of the celebrations of 250 years of James Cook's explorations of Eastern Australia, most of which, however, were cancelled in course of 2020's COVID-19 outbreak. It was part of a film project about Aboriginal Australians' perennial contacts with sailors from South Sulawesi that predate Cook's voyage by at least 50 years, and that have left an enduring legacy in Northern Australia. The vessel was built in the yard of Haji Jafar, a master shipwright from Lemo Lemo and descendant of the boat builders who had built the ships that in the 18th and 19th century frequented Northern Australia. Haji Jafar had built Haji Marege in course of Australia's bicentennial celebration sailed to Arnhem Land and Darwin in 1987 and a replica of a late 19th century vessel for an exhibition in Belgium in 2017. The owners expected the ship for the present project to represent a possible design of a considerably older vessel, equipped with, at least for filming purposes, sails, rigging and any other easily visible tackle made from authentic materials, or at least fabrics that could pass as such on pictures. It should also have adequate grace and polish that is not look like the many unattractive and dirty vessels so often seen in Indonesian harbours. And lastly, it should be safe to make the voyage to Australia and possibly serve as people not used to sailing vessels. In Thousand of Asia, ships are constructed planks first, that is, not around frames, like in European traditions. To achieve symmetrical shape, until recently the planking of most vessels was arranged according to one of the two indigenous blueprints that prescribe the positions, numbers and shapes of the elements in a hull slower planking onto which then the ship's upper works would be added. Here, for example, fashioning a padavakang or a palari, depending on your appreciation of the hull's lines, that is, palari means runner, thus would have a less beamier and sharper hull than a padavakang. The only pre-century information shedding some light on construction techniques we are aware of is a footnote in an English translation of a late 18th century travel report that describes the awkwardly low bows of South Sulawesi ships. We assume that the author's notion of that lowered bow meant this feature, clearly visible on models and photographs up to the mid-20th century and readily recognized by Lemo Lemo shipwrights as a result of an enlarged basic hull. We thus assumed that larger 18th century ships would have been built in essentially the same way as those of the ensuing century, a basic hull topped by upper works that fit the vessel's purpose. As it is the most common building pattern of a ship of the anticipated size, the shipwrights decided to use the Tatatalu blueprint for the lower hull. Building such a ship commences with contriving the Panata, a length of bamboo that contains the hull's major measurements. This made not only for exotic filming, but as the future's owner's hand span is taken as a basic measurement unit, creates a spiritual bond between him and the shipwrights, which, very possibly due to the pleasant and genteel disposition of her owner, in the case of Nural Marege, easily substituted the services of at least two lawyers' offices. The first step in the building of a vessel with a Tata plan is transferring the measurements on the Panata onto the keel. For Tatatalu blueprint, there will be marks for 19 main units, alternatingly named Tambugu and Ruang. These units provide references for the placement of the dowels holding the planks together, the length of the various planks in the pattern, and the positioning of the hull frames. The main idea behind the system is to ensure that the various dowels neither interfere with one another nor will be placed at sensible spots like plank parts or under frames, thus safeguarding the structural integrity of the ship. Documentation of the building process was in the hands of an international team of researchers and students from Italy, Indonesia and Japan. 
A main part of the documentation was a photogrammetrical recording of the hull, from which a three-dimensional model was created. The model allows to outline, at least partly, the planking pattern of the hull, here seen in a flattened view. As far as this can be traced, the pattern confirms most of what we know from the ethnographic record with the arrangement of a Tatatalo blueprint. However, there is yet were no records for a pattern using as many as 12 strakes of short planks in the lower hull. While shape and arrangements of the lower hull did not pose particular problems for the builders, layout of the upper works was topic of extended discussions. For the kind of vessel the owners had asked for, the shipwrights recommended the square for an aft sails known as Tanjarik on two masts, at least one of which should be a tripod. A central hatch covered by a roof-like structure known as Kurung that could make up for a cabin and a high end overhang poop deck, under which a cabin with sideways openings allows access to the lateral rudders. Offered a number of alternatives, the owners eventually favoured a set of models of the first half of the 19th century. First of all, because these models supply the earliest comprehensive information available to us, and secondly, because of a certain stylishness if compared to what we know about later vessels. In many an aspect, these models concur with a number of drawings by a Dutch Navy officer from the early 19th century and rather detailed descriptions in a written source from 1854, and surprisingly an end 19th century drawing of a Malay pirate in the Persian Gulf seen by an English painter on a yachting trip. There, however, is a number of rather obvious differences to later ships, the most striking of which are the elaborate stern cabins not found on later vessels. These stern cabins are not fashioned by continuing the topside planking or the rails from amidships, but set upon the various beams holding the rudders that top the underlying hull's aft chip. This feature is clearly visible when projecting Noel Marica's cabin sides onto a flattened view of a hull's planking. As described by a number of eyewitnesses, the rudders are moved from inside this cabin in contrast to more recent vessels, where the tillers are accessible from the main deck. No one in recent memory had ever built such an aft cabin and the distinct rudder fittings that went with it. Thus, despite various dry trials during the construction, angle of tillers and rudders in relation to the dimensions of the available openings were a constant problem. Only after repeated adjustments was it possible to realize the ideal steering position, that is, sitting leisurely on the poop and moving the tillers with the feet through the steering hatch. When, however, three of the four available rudders broke in high seas, the newly made rudders again demanded to be steered by standing in the hatches, with neither time nor occasion at hand for further overhauls. Another feature peculiar to earlier models and representations is the kind of shallow galleries that along the main deck project to outside of the hull. These galleries appear to have been rather common on early 19th century vessels, but are not shown on later photographs or models. On Nur al Marege they rather naturally became welcome storage space and davids for the vessel's dinghies, just as seen here on a mid 19th century model. A further feature found on those older models is a dedicated cable storage built into the forward deck behind the bulwark that closes the upper works of the low foreship. As described in written sources, this locker was covered by split bamboo and used not only for anchor cables and other lines, but, as it was close to the galley, became the crew's respite from excessive demands by their officers. For reenactment scenes, Noel Marege set a pair of sails made from Lontar palm fiber, the cloth for which had to be ordered in the northern parts of the peninsula of South Sulawesi. Just as reported by a number of observers, such sails are not necessarily strong wind canvas, and the main ripped on the second occasion of being used in a wind of 5 BFT. Given the fairly rough treatment sails have to endure when being maneuvered in any somewhat stronger airs, it was decided to use a second set of plastic canvas for any true sailing and preserve the Londa palm sails for reenactment scenes under better conditions. 
For such scenes, any modern equipment that had to be carried on deck was routinely camouflaged with mats and spare sailcloth. Efforts were made to ban any modern crockery from the foredeck galley. Yet, even when filming what would seem to be rather traditional topics, the crew was not always aware of the idea of reenacting the life of 200 years ago. Seagoing ships have to be registered and licensed, a process that is subject to various rules, many of which are dependent on national particularities. The dimensions of the hulls, planking and framing by far exceeded national Indonesian requirements, while several of the potential unsafe layout features, for example the large central hatch or the openings in the aft cabin, were not at all inspected or questioned. Instead, the various officers involved constantly asked for details of the ship's engine, and insisted that there should be engineers and other mechanical personnel among the crew. It thus was necessary to repeatedly point out that Nural Marege carried no engine but was sail driven only, and that national regulations actually accept non motorized vessels of a size from most licensing procedures. Evidently less negotiable are navigation and safety. The vessel was equipped as far as possible in accordance with the applicable international standards and thus by far exceeded in Indonesian requirements as well as Australia's Northern Territory's rather permissive regulations. Only one crew member had, several dozen years ago, navigated a ship as far east as the island of Alor, thus confining the possibility of using local cognitive navigation to waters no further than the islands of Ponerate. However, by regulation carrying a GPS chart plotter and having several crew with navigation programs on their smartphones made even the use of paper charts look very much traditional. Modern national borders demand ships to clear out of one and into another country at dedicated ports. It thus was not possible to use the time-proven route of 19th century Trepangers. As a result, for safety and timely reasons, it became necessary to tow the ship for much of its voyage through Australian waters. While Noral Marege more than complied with Northern Territory's rules for watercraft of her kind, entering Australia meant facing another bureaucratic hurdle, the country's strict quarantine and biosecurity procedures that upon some deliberations demanded the ship to be taken ashore for a thorough fumigation. This necessitated unloading of about one half of the all in all 14 metric tons of ballast stones that were distributed throughout the villages. As it was truly traditional ballast, much of the work aboard had to be done in traditional ways. On the land side, though, some more contemporary appliances could be employed. It proved impossible to convince the respective officers that during the perhaps 300 years of continual contact, including numerous beachings of vessels and operating extensive camps on land, most if not all potential invasive species could have already made their way from Sulawesi to Northern Australia. Thus, fumigation alone was found not sufficient to stop potential pests from entering the fifth continent, and so complete replacement of the ballast was requested. The area around Darwin does not produce heavy masonry, so that the landscaping pebbles and boulders replacing the original ballast of river stones reportedly were imports from the Indonesian island of Bali. The ship now being on shore made it possible to at least partly employ some modern machinery. In the end, the crew had, all in all, moved about 28 tons of stones. From Darwin, Noel Marege was towed for the last 500 nautical miles to a final destination, the aboriginal Australian town of Yirkala, where a great reception had been arranged. This time not a reenacted scene, but a real-time reminder of an area without borders and biosecurity, of wooden ships sailing without engines and the skills to build such vessels and sail them beyond the horizon. <laughs>